from Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Captain Carl Zimmerman. Today, our single corps cameramen take us around the world in a pictorial report on the activities of your army. A story of helicopters over Berlin, training of the South Korean Army, French forces in action, testing of the armored vest by the infantry and the quartermaster corps, a review of the 8th Army Honor Guard, and a report on the work of the wax in Europe. First, we take you to Berlin, and this report from the Tempelhof Air Terminal. This is Lieutenant Frank Grubbs, your military correspondent here in the European Command, reporting to you on one of the many activities of our armed forces in this part of the world. Today's report comes to you from Tempelhof Air Base in the center of the city of Berlin, the scene of the very famous Berlin airlift. The story of the airlift has been told many times, but today we're going to tell you of a new an unusual activity here. Now landing just behind me is one of the helicopters who regularly patrol the western sectors of Berlin. Its pilot is Captain Mel Schumacher. We're going to talk with Captain Schumacher to learn the story of helicopters over Berlin. How do you do, Captain Schumacher? How do you do? Sir, you're from uh, what part of the states? Wyoming, Laramie, Wyoming. Laramie, Wyoming. We'd like to ask you a few questions about your unit and about its mission here, if you don't mind answering them. Oh, well, certainly, we'd be glad to. Right. What is the designation of your unit, Captain? This is the Army Aviation Section of the 6th Infantry Regiment. Well, then then you're not a uh, an Air Force unit based here, but uh, an Army unit. Definitely, we are an Army unit, but based on Tempelhof Air Base. Captain, we know that uh, infantry regiments have uh, L-type, liaison-type planes. In this case, the uh, 6th Infantry Regiment has helicopters. Will you tell us why? There are two reasons. One, the peculiar characteristics of the area that we have to cover here in Berlin there are three allied sectors and approximately three million people congested, packed within these sectors. Two, the uh, maneuverability of this aircraft allows us to hover, land, take off from small areas. Also, uh, land in streets if uh, it's necessary. It's uh, an ideal ship for this type of work. Could you tell us something about the history, the background of your unit? Well, due to the mission we have to perform here, it was felt that an aircraft of this type would be, uh, could be well adapted. And the authorization was granted, and this section was activated in May 1951. Since that date, we have been in continuous operation here. A routine mission for these helicopter pilots may consist of patrolling the borders of the West Sector. The remains of the once proud Brandenburg Gate can be seen just over the border in the Soviet zone. The new marble structure is a memorial in honor of the Russian soldiers killed in the Second World War. It's an important job these helicopter pilots have, observing the activities of the people in the western part of Berlin. Pilots also help with special jobs of air observation, including missions for the Army engineers, and cooperating with the West Berlin police to see that the big city keeps running smoothly. Vital supply routes leading into the city, such as railway arteries, are checkpoints for the helicopter pilots. Power plants, too, are important to the city's well-being. 
as are the canals which play their part in the city's traffic flow. Yes, there are many useful jobs to be done by the versatile helicopters over Berlin. We'll return to Europe later, but now a report on our Korean military assistance group. We learn how our officers and men are helping in the training of the South Korean Army. That the U in UN means united is an everyday fact in the 10th Corps sector of Korea. Here, seeking a mutual goal, victory over the communists, American and South Korean army officers work side by side. The Americans are called the KMAG for Korean Military Advisory Group. KMAG officers advise ROK, Republic of Korea officers on the organization, training, and operation of a modern army. KMAG and ROK officers coordinate in almost every army activity. Because of the mountainous Korean terrain, there's plenty of work to be done by the ROK engineers, assisted by the KMAG advisor, building roads, bridges, and airfields. Another continuous job is the problem of logistics, which means getting what you need, where you need it, on time. Here again, the KMAG advisor and the ROK officer work together in close harmony. Some frontline Republic of Korea troops are supplied by this water route, which terminates in a tramway at the top of a mountain. In the ROK division headquarters, a KMAG officer assists and advises the South Korean commanding general in establishing policy and arriving at basic decisions. A diplomat and a soldier, the senior advisor must gain the confidence of the general and help him fit the ROK division into the UN team. The ROK general, young, aggressive, and able, is typical of the new leadership in the South Korean Army. An interruption by the ROK G3 officer, who has an urgent message for the general. A heavily fortified enemy bunker is harassing the frontline troops and must be knocked out. The word goes out quickly. Artillery is ordered to destroy the enemy position. Meanwhile, the Division KMAG Operations Advisor alerts the Artillery Advisor, and along the lines go the messages that set in motion the effective KMAG and ROK teamwork. As the KMAG Artillery Advisor looks on, the ROK Battery Executive Officer gives the firing orders. Bad news for the enemy, on the way. Mission accomplished, bunker destroyed. With each passing day, the KMAG officers and men in the 10th Corps sector, working with and among the South Koreans, are accomplishing the greater mission of welding together what was once just a small internal security force into an effective, fully armed Republic of Korea Army. Today, this ROK Army, guided by the Korean Military Advisory Group, is helping the United Nations to defend the principles of freedom. In another part of Korea, along the 2nd Division front, our cameras are set up now to show you a French battalion in action. Volunteer French Battalion is a very effective part of the UN forces fighting in Korea. These hardy veterans of many bitter Korean battles have a unique method of target practice. The purpose of the training is to instill confidence in the soldier for his weapon and for the efficiency of his comrades in arms. 
Because of the superb marksmanship of these fighters, there is no danger of accident. But this type of training is recommended for experts only. Assaulting a hill or enemy position is another specialty of the unit. A murderous concentration of fire at short range, such as this, inflicts heavy punishment to enemy forces. This is Lieutenant Colonel Francois Boré, commander of French forces in Korea. Colonel, we've just witnessed some very interesting training with your battalion. Would you tell us the purpose of this type of training? The purpose of this kind of training is to develop the self-control and chiefly confidence in their friends. It may seem very dangerous, but it is proved to be effective and we have not had any accident because this training is progressive and we realize this performance only at the end of an intensive training period. I am particularly proud of the French battalion and I am sure it will continue to be an effective part of the United Nations effort. Recently, men of the Army's 3rd Division worked with specialists of the Quartermaster Corps in testing the armored vest. For this report, we go back to Korea. On a hillside in Korea, soldiers of the 3rd Division are briefed on the use of a new armored vest. Like the Knights of King Arthur's Round Table going into battle with their steel breastplates and shirts of chain mail, these modern crusaders move out on patrol wearing the latest fiberglass and nylon armor of 1952. Thoroughly tested in stateside laboratories, the soldier's new body armor weighs less than eight pounds and affords protection from shoulders to waist. In this exhaustive field trial and combat, fighting men of all arms find the lightweight armored vest does not hamper their movements in any way. While the armor is definitely not a so-called bulletproof vest, it will stop low-velocity small arms fire and, most important, fragmentation bursts which cause more than 70% of all combat casualties. At the rendezvous area, the members of the patrol report on their vests to the inspecting officer. Shipped back to Quartermaster Repair Center, battle-scarred vests are examined by experts and the field reports are read. The amazing protection afforded by this new body armor comes from overlapping plates of plastic laminated fiberglass and a special weave of multi-layered nylon fabric. A surgical scalpel probes deeply into the vest, hunting fragments. And there it is. Though small, this fragment could have caused a serious wound. After inspection and removal of all fragments, the vest is ready to be repaired. Like making a cold patch on the tube of an automobile tire, the repairman first applies a generous amount of rosin glue to the affected area. The special patch follows, and after pressing it firmly in place and wiping away excess glue, the job is done. Fully repaired, the vest returns to the battlefront and worn by a combat infantryman is ready to stop enemy shell fragments and save another man's life. Back at 8th Army headquarters, there is a platoon of men called the Honor Guard. They've all seen combat in Korea, and now they're on guard duty back at Army headquarters in Seoul. They're proud of their precision drill. They're anxious to show it to you. We take you now to Seoul, Korea, and here is the commander of the platoon, interviewed by one of our big picture reporters, Lieutenant Carl Flint.
This is Lieutenant Carl Flint speaking to you from the grounds of the Tak Su Kung Palace in Seoul, Korea. The men you see hard at work drilling are members of the 8th Army Honor Guard. This unique organization is a platoon composed of combat men with representatives from every American division now fighting in Korea. Tell us more about the Honor Guard and their mission. Let me introduce Lieutenant Robert W. Hedlund of Los Angeles, California, commanding officer of the 8th Army Honor Guard. Lieutenant Hedlund, front and center, please. Bob, when was the Honor Guard activated? The Honor Guard was activated in March of 1951 of a representative group from all the combat divisions in Korea. I see. Now, besides performing for visiting dignitaries and officials, the Honor Guard does have a specific military mission, doesn't it? Yes, sir. The Honor Guard has a security mission, part of which is providing guards for the Army commander. They do this by having posts at the Army commander's CP door, at his quarters, and at his office door. I see. Uh, do you have much of a turnover problem? How do you select new men for the Honor Guard? Turnover is a bit of a problem in as much as the men have already been in combat divisions before they come back to the Guard. We compensate for this by having approximately 20 to 30 men come down each month after being interviewed by divisions. They're then interviewed by the Honor Guard, and about 10 to 15 are kept to compensate for the men we lose. I see. Well, Bob, would you put the band and honor guard through a dress rehearsal of the silent drill? I'm sure the people back home will be impressed just as much as I was when I first saw your honor guard performing. Yes, sir, it would be a pleasure. gathered together to form an honor guard of snap and precision are veterans of all the divisions fighting the war in Korea. Some of the shoulder patches worn by these men include the 8th Army Patch, 45th Division, 2nd Infantry, and 25th Division, 1st Cavalry, and 7th Division Patch. These are men who have known the horrors of war but who also know the pride of serving with the best team in the world, the United States Army.
The silent marching manual is one of the most difficult feats for a drill team to perform. Since there are no verbal commands given during the entire manual, each man is required to keep in perfect rhythm with the rest of the unit at all times. To accomplish this, each soldier must concentrate not only on the marching cadence and movements, but on the cadence and movement of his rifle as well. Hours of training are necessary to perfect the marching routine, but there are few rivals of this 8th Army Honor Guard. Each soldier is called on to perform as an integral part of the platoon, sometimes moving with the entire platoon, other times operating with his particular squad, and often performing as an individual in coordination with the rest of the unit. Their exacting synchronization of rhythm and movement are a constant source of pride to troops in the Far East Command. Our cameras take us back to Europe now for a report on the women in the army, the wax. And to greet us, here is a very charming young lady. Well, hi there. I am one of the many wax serving in Europe. I want you folks back home to know that we are over here to aid the armed forces in Europe in their job of preserving the peace. And it's a bang-up job they're turning out. In communications, as operators of complicated accounting and business machines, and in the Army's dental and medical laboratories, or as specialists over drafting boards. At these and countless other jobs in European Command Headquarters, Uncle Sam's career women are continuing to prove that soldiering is no longer exclusively a man's profession. Like her brother in the ranks, the whack at Heidelberg knows all the duties and obligations of the soldier, and even field work is part of her daily routine. The diehards of the old school begrudgingly admit that thanks to map reading, these are young women who really know their way around. With equal skill, the hand that held the compact has taken up the compass. With justifiable pride in themselves and their outfit, UCOM's wax turn out on the parade grounds in a way to make seasoned troops sit up and take notice. Spit and polish isn't confined to the parade grounds. Patton House, the wax quarters, is subject to regular inspection where personal appearance and care of equipment must measure up to military standards. Teaching isn't confined to housekeeping. Many of these young women are enrolled in the Army's I and D classes to work for degrees conferred by the University of Maryland's overseas unit. Now, will you please all say the sentence, Heidelberg ist schön. Heidelberg ist schön. Well, that's just excellent. 
There's room in the career woman's program for social welfare work. Under the friendly guidance of these ambassadors of goodwill, German youth is learning to play, work, and train for a life in the newer democratic Germany. Athletics and outdoor recreation have their place in the wax life, and the Army provides facilities and equipment for enjoying them. Perhaps one of the happiest uses the WAC finds for free hours is sightseeing. Today it's Heidelberg, but tomorrow it may be Lake Lucerne, Versailles, Brussels, or Paris. To the average American, these are dreams never to be realized, just names or pictures out of travel agency advertisements. To the WAC at UCOM, they are easily reached playgrounds where she may spend her next furlough. Shopping, that mysterious female ritual which always baffles mere man, continues to be part of the Army woman's way of life. In her off-duty hours, she carries on the never-ending search for what she considers to be absolute necessities. Through her perseverance, the Quain shops of Heidelberg are contributing daily to the unused storage space in countless American attics and cellars. Shopping isn't the only carryover from civilian days. Like her sister at home, the WAC finds time for a bit of vanity over that new dress. At work and at play, the UCOM WAC finds in her Army career a rich and rewarding experience. Today we brought you a pictorial report on the activities of your Army overseas. We hope that you can be with us next week when we take you to the home of the infantry, Fort Benning, Georgia. We'll show you how combat leaders are trained. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Photographic Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today. The United States Army.